Good morning, World Outreach Revival Center. Brother David Meeks here waiting on you and I to have our Bible study today. <clears throat> for those that don't know it, every Tuesday morning we have had Bible study for many weeks and um, a months and years. Um, on Tuesday mornings, it's a study through the Bible. We've studied the book of Acts. We've studied the book of Romans. I think we've gone through Hebrews, and uh, now we're uh, in the book of 1 Corinthians. Sarah, good to have you this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Pam Clausen, good to have you. Nikki, good to have you. Joseph Merwin, good to have you. <clears throat> so uh, it is good to have all of you. We'll wait a couple of minutes and see who else is online with us. Um, we appreciate... Uh, all of you that joined us last night for prayer meeting, it was very powerful. And let me, can I just tell you uh, something real neat? On Tuesday mornings, uh, good morning, Billy. Uh, on Tuesday mornings, we have Sister Maddie, it's good to have you too. A lot of folks just popping up real quick. I guess we're getting used to it now. But Tuesday mornings, we have a Bible study or a prayer meeting with the pastors. And um, we've, been, we've been doing it uh, by the Zoom app. And uh, I want you to know something. I was so blessed today with the pastors on there praying um, it was from a variety of churches. But uh, man, talking about a heart, uh, awesome. Amy, good to have you. Elizabeth Irving, good to have you. Jason, good to have you. My goodness, we've got a bunch of people jumping on this morning first thing. It's a little chilly outside this morning. We had our prayer outside. And, uh, well, I did, and I had to stop and leave uh, the Zoom broadcast and go get my jacket. So, um, this weather is kind of crazy. Amen. Thank you, Amy, for tagging joy. I think that's what that means. So, we're going to get everybody woke up and, and connected here. <clears throat> and we're going to uh, study the Word of God together. And, Melanie, uh, Amen. Just wake everybody up. Let's get them all on the word this morning. It is good to have each of you. Amen. Jason, I hope you're doing fine, my brother. Sharon McKinney, good to have you. Jason, how's the weather where you are? Are you in good weather or snowy weather? Um, amen. I think Jeremy was in snowy weather. It's good to have you sharing with us this morning. <clears throat> see what else pops on here in just a couple of minutes that was one of the fastest uh, uh, that we've ever been on on live and, and got everybody on here good morning Joy good to have you this morning amen okay we're just going to wait a moment and uh, I'm going to leave the, the uh, camera for one minute and go get a uh, tissue just in case I happen to have to sneeze or something so I've been outside in that pollen world and uh, I can feel my nose is a little a little uh, strange Alice good to have you this morning I'll be right back I'm back Tori, good to have Tori from Texas and Bridget this morning. Amen. See who else signs in this morning first thing. But it's so good to have you guys. And uh, in just a moment, we're going to get started. And uh, for those that are just tuning in, uh, bright and 40 degrees and sunny, that's good. Amen. For Kendall, good to have you. Uh, we, um, this is a Bible study that we do on a regular basis. And uh, normally I do a daily word of encouragement. It's at noon every day. But on Tuesdays, I meet, start at 930 because it's just a Bible study. And it lasts an hour. And if it's boring, just all you have to do is say boring. Well, I'll do some headstands or something. But usually we do pretty good. So, um, uh, everyone seems to join in, so if you have a thought or something to say in a minute, just feel free to dive in and say, hey, Brother Dave, um, what about this? And 
We'll try to answer your questions and get everybody on the same line here. But we're in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So we've got 20 of you in our Bible study. That's better than we normally have. So uh, it is good to have you. I think what we'll do when we get back in the room, um, we'll keep it live. I'll probably uh, just set up the camera so that truck drivers or anybody that wants to be here that isn't in the building can, can be a part of this thing as well because um, it's just pretty awesome how many get to join in in their pajamas if they want to. I told Sister Tammy, I said, I want to I wanna do the Zoom for the Bible study. She said, you can't. I said, well, why not? She says, because it's so convenient for people. They might have a baby on their hip or, you know, feeding children or in their pajamas or no makeup on. or And I, they can just come the way they are. I said, I understand. I surrender. So we won't Zoom it, but we'll do it this way. And uh, anyway, it's good to have you. Um, with us. So we'll just keep the camera live during all the Bible studies, even in the future. And uh, Brother Kenny and uh, a few of the truck drivers wanted to to be a part of it. And we were trying to figure out how to do it, but just didn't realize, I guess I didn't think that uh, the live, um, this is on the World Outreach Facebook page. So it's exclusively to you guys. And if you feel to share it, you can share it. But um, anyway, let's pray and we're going to get started and go right through the Word of God. And I hope to answer some questions for some of you that um, when you read the Bible, sometimes it's tough to understand. It really is. Uh, so let's pray. Father, we ask you in Jesus' name to bless each one, Lord, that's here, that's listening, Lord, that you will touch each life. Father, that uh, you will come with the spirit of wisdom and knowledge, Lord, and Open your word up and bring it to life to us, God, that we can to grow by it, Father. And Lord, we thank you for it, Lord. We praise you for it. We ask you, God, to bless your word today and uh, to minister your word today and uh, uh, just, just help it to resonate inside our spirits that it can be our faith builder, our, our life encourager, our strength, Lord, that we can learn by it in Jesus' name. And we all said, amen. <coughs> Excuse me. We're in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to get right into it. Tony, good to have you. Butch Buris, good to have you. Um, I guess you're setting me down on the side uh, over there while you're uh, working, maybe. I'm not sure how that's going, but it's good to have you. Um, and uh, Melissa, uh, I, uh, good morning, uh, uh, Billy Meeks, uh, uh, and others that have joined in. Um, uh, I was going to say, oh, Melissa, I got your text with the pictures um, just a few minutes ago, but I've been in uh, a pastor's prayer this morning, first thing, and then now the Bible study. So after this, I'll take a look at it. But it is good to have all of you, and uh, uh, some of those that aren't, their names aren't on my screen, uh, we welcome you. And uh, so we're in chapter 11 of the book of 1 Corinthians. And here's the thing, I keep reiterating this and throwing it back because we've got to grab a hold of this. Uh, Sue Pearson, good to have you. Is that the church in Corinth, and we hopefully you've read the book of Corinthians before, 1 and 2 Corinthians. They had a major problem. And it just stems right back where in the very beginning, he's writing a letter to a church that is a growing church. They have plenty of people. They're a spirit-filled church, but they have envy, strife, and division. Every single time I keep bringing that up, and probably I, I won't stop until we finish out this book, because where there's envy, and you can take envy and put it in many uh, ways to look at it. It's a form of jealousy, uh, just grab a hold of that. So where there's envy and where there is strife, that causing frustration, uh, arguments, uh, comparing. One of the biggest things of envy, because envy is disguised sometimes. Um, I was praying the other day and I found myself in a place comparing me to somebody else. And I said, God, that's envy. Stop it. I said, I rebuke that in Jesus name. Forgive me, Lord. We can't compare. That's where envy comes in. We just have to be what God wants us to be. Don't, don't you dare 
forgive me for being so strong on that, compare yourself to somebody else. You have your calling, your purpose, and so does somebody else. I, I, I said this a while back. I said the same grace that might keep someone out of a hole is the same grace that pulled someone from the hole. I, I want you to hear me. The same grace that might keep someone from falling in a hole is the same grace that pulls someone out of the hole. So none of us have bragging rights. We all are in need of God. Uh, Paul said, one plants, one waters, but basically we're nothing. We're just sons and daughters of God trying to fulfill our calling and our purpose. And when we start comparing ourselves to others, we get envy. And when envy comes in, then we start bickering. And where there's bickering, then there's division. So when you compare, when you get envy, when you get jealous, uh, there's bickering. When there's bickering, there's division. And listen to me close. When there's division, everything gets blurred from that point forward until you, re you reconcile that division, until you can get rid of it, until you can lay it before God and get rid of those things. It's amazing to me that Paul wrote, wrote this whole book in the realm of the problem with division. And uh, I'm going to go... Um, Chapter 10 or 11, uh, now we're all the way in chapter 11, and he starts the book out with division and envy and jealousy and all that stuff. But I want us to go to chapter 11, and I just want you to uh, look at verse 18. It says, For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. He brings it back up all the way in chapter 11. Why? Because he knew this is a, a disease in the house of God that will stop its power. Because when you can't see the direction you're going, when you can't clearly see what sin is and what sin isn't, when you can't clearly hear God's voice, hey, Caitlin, Hey, Darren Champagne, when you can't hear clearly God's voice, that will blur everything. In the entire church in Corinth, although they were spirit-filled and had miracles and had tongues and interpretations of tongues and prophecies and all the things we believe in, because they had envy, then they had arguments which brought division. It blurred the whole future for them. So Paul is writing his letter to a church that has a blurred vision and he's trying to readjust them completely so they can see the proper way. Does it kind of remind you of the church today that we, uh, as a church worldwide, you know, th this church says this is okay. This church says that's okay. This church says this isn't okay. This church says... No, that's not okay. This church says, why are you judging them? And it's a blurred vision when the scriptures are very clear. It blows my mind sometimes when someone says, well, that's not, we're, we can do that or we can't do that. And I'm saying, but what does the word say? The word is our guideline. It's our plumb bob. It, it, is, the, it is the foundation by which we stand. And we can't pull a scripture out and say, I'm going to apply this to me. And build around it. We take all the scriptures and let him build it around us so that we know the direction we're going. And the first thing I know, where there's envy, comparing me to somebody else or jealousy or whatever the case may be, that's the first step of bringing a strife or an argument or an anger in my life. Immediately I need to repent and get rid of that or it will bring separation. And where there's envy, strife, and division then everything else gets blurred. I know I'm repeating myself, but I just want you to get it. Everything gets blurred and you can't see correctly. It's hard for you to even judge sin correctly if you're judging it from an impure perspective. Are you hearing me? It's hard. You know, there's times in my life, and, and uh, I don't want to ramble on too much, but there's times in my life as a pastor that uh, I've had to make decisions for people that are life-changing. I've had to make decisions for uh, a ministry that are life-changing. And in the midst of that, what I had to do 
is before I can make a decision, I want you to listen. Take this as a good word of advice. Before I can make a decision that is a life decision, before I can, uh, amen, Darren, it's all pride, the origin of sin. Amen. Before I can make a decision that is life-changing or give advice, I must be sure that I'm seeing from a pure perspective. So if I have envy or division, or strife inside my life, I stop right there and, and I, I will say to people, I'm not capable of giving you advice at the moment. And I have to get me in order. And once my heart is in order, then I can see clearly to give advice to somebody else. I think there's a scripture that says, you know, why do you try to take the splinter out of someone else's eye when there's a whole board in your own eye? That's a crazy scripture if you think about it. Why would you try to take a splinter out of somebody's eye when there's a board in yours and you can't see the board? I'll tell you why you can't see the board because you live in comparing yourself to others or jealousy. You live where there's strife and then we live knowing where there's strife and jealousy. There is division and then according to what Paul wrote here, we can't see truth. We can't see clearly. Okay, I beat that up pretty good, so I hope you're, uh, you're okay with me. We're going to go to chapter 11. I want to say this. From 11 down to uh, uh, 16, this can be some of the most confusing scriptures in, your, in this text. But understand this. Jesus is writing, or Paul is writing, to a church that is in a whole cultural different world than you and I are. If you were to go to Iran or Iraq right now, I think in Iran or, or Iraq, I'm not sure which one, I, I believe that it's, it's a not legal for women to be outside without their head covered up. Uh, we don't live in that culture. And so when Paul is speaking to the church and he's giving them some liberties where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, he's fighting. And then he's readjusting an entire culture of a group of people that have been uh, uh, built and existed in that culture for hundreds of years, if not thousands. So you can't just come in and say, okay, guess what? We're going to shift everything. You'd have pandemonium. You'd have chaos. So he's trying to come into it and work with the culture that is there. Someone said, well, the Bible endorses slavery. No, it doesn't. It's just there was slavery, so they addressed slavery. Where there's cultural issues, they address the cultural issue. And it doesn't necessarily mean that God is 100% okay with it. It just means that's what we do. We, we are built in a cultural mindset and so it's different. In the United States of America, just a, a, a few hundred years ago, um, women gained a voting right. But if you go to other countries, I'm not sure about all that. So I'm saying there's some shifting that goes on. Thank God for where we live. I thank God for the United States of America. I really do. I thank God for the liberties we have. And we've got some mixed up things that's going on. But still we have a freedom. And everyone that I that I speak with that comes from another country and comes here, even in our worst, it's better than some of their best. So thank the Lord for the country. So we're going to start with chapter 11. I'm going to read to you and try to break this down. I'm, not, I'm just going to try to read all the way down to verse 16. And then from there, we're going to jump over uh, to some other things that, that start bringing, uh, that are more um, applicable to today into the church. So here we go. Be ye followers of me, even as I am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. And I'll just start with this. It's a pretty awesome thing to be able to say to somebody, follow me. Do what I do. Come and watch my life. And that's what Christians do. Oh, if you want to strive for something, strive to say, God, let my life be a living epistle. Let the world read my life. Not that you're going to be perfect, but if you mess up, just repent, own up to your mistakes and say, but I love Jesus and go forward in him. I'm not making excuses for sin. I'm just saying, 
Ask God to use you. Let that be your goal. God, I want to be a living scripture is what it means. I want to be a love letter that you wrote to the world as they look at me. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. Now, the Apostle Paul is establishing headship because they had a lot of issues going on in this day. Okay, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, for that's even all one as if she were shaven. For if a woman be not covered, let her also be shaved, shave her head. But if, uh, if it be a shame for a woman to be shaved or shaven, let her be covered. For man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power, for this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things are of God. And that's kind of the key part. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. And he's given a picture of two different directions here. In the culture they're, li they're living in, he's explaining the woman came after the man and all these headships and things that are going on in their, their world of culture. And then he brings it down. But understand this. We're together in this thing called Christianity. There's neither male nor female in Christ. So he's addressing their cultural world, but then he brings in, we're living in the world of Christianity, where there's neither Jew nor Gentile, there's neither male nor female. We're all before the Lord equal. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man of the woman, but all things are of God. Judging yourselves, is it comely for a woman to pray to God uncovered? <laughs> Talking about a veil. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it's a shame to him? Oh my, we just got in trouble there. But if a woman have long hair, it's a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for covering. Understand, they're dealing with cultural issues. But if any man, listen, seem to be contentious, we have no such customs, neither the church of God. And what he's saying, in the church, none of this really applies. When you're a Christian, you just love the Lord and you serve God. You're going to fall into some cultural issues. We in our nation have had cultural issues that, that have been there. And since I've, as, as I've grown older, I have seen the culture of our society change. So have you. There's some things back in the 60s that were not accepted. Today, they're commonplace because cultures shift. And as they shift, you adjust to those things, whether right or wrong. It's the culture we live in. And sometimes the culture tries to shift in areas that are sinful and wrong, that are ungodly. And some, they just advance better for the betterment of everybody. But it doesn't change God's word. That's why Paul said in the scriptures, there's neither male nor female. In Christ, we're all one. We must submit one to another in the fear of God. Submitting to each other, honor. It says to esteem others better than ourselves. It says if a rich man comes into your building and a poor man comes into your building, don't accept the rich man and put the poor man down. It said because we're all one in God. Do you understand? We were in a pastor's prayer this morning and it's pretty neat. There's a variety. I think we have some uh, uh, what you call full gospel, Pentecostal types. We have some Baptists. Um, I'm trying to think what have we have just a few varieties of pastors in there. And here was the prayer of God. It doesn't matter what denomination or what we're from. We need to be in unity, standing together. And man, it excited my heart because, and I told him, I said, you know, when you're in a foxhole in, in a military term, it's an old term, I'm sure, but you're in a foxhole shooting at the enemy. You don't look at the guy next to you and say, hey man, I know you got a gun. I know you're shooting at the enemy, but I don't like you because of the color of your skin, or I don't like you because of where you're from, or, hey, you're a female. I 
I don't want to be shooting at the enemy or, or you know, you you think you're a big shot or you're too poor or, you know, you're too this or you're too that. When you're in a hole fighting an enemy, you want anybody, as long as they can pull the trigger and point the gun in the right direction, you want them beside you. And that's the call of the church is to say we are in a war and we want whomever God puts beside us, right beside us. And so that spirit of unity is so vital. And that's why Paul had to break this down because they had so many issues. They were almost going crazy. I think they wrote him a letter before this and said, here's our questions. And man, they were, I'm, Paul's probably saying, where are you people coming from? You know, walk with God and let him guide your lives. I'll say this, Jesus said, I'll sum all the commandments up in two. All the law and all the prophet is fulfilled in two commands. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You and I know that. That's what he calls us to do. Love our neighbor as ourself. And when we begin to do that, most of these concerns in the book of Corinthians won't even exist. When we love our neighbor as ourself, we don't have envy. When we love our neighbor as ourself, we don't allow strife to come in. When we love our neighbor as ourself, we don't allow division to come in. And, and I want you to hear me for, I know I'm repeating this. The number one, everyone say number one, the number one uh, strategy of the devil is to divide and conquer. He always wants to separate you from the rest of the body. I promise you. And he'll use whatever means he can. Well, I'm not going to be around them no more because I don't believe exactly the way they believe. I want you to know something. Pull the good out of them and hang on to it because you don't want division to get in there. Well, my, my friend said something about me and, you know, then go get it straight, but don't allow division. Are, are you hearing me? Because the moment division comes in, I, I've been in this a long time, guys. I've been pastoring now 33 years, and before that, for 11 years, or 10 years, 10 or 11 years, I was just in charge of people. That's, that's what I did. And, and I found one thing, that when there was envy and there was strife, there was always division, and division always destroys any accomplishment. The enemy knows that. We must fight to say, I will not be divided from my brother, my sister. I will fight to stay connected. Sometimes we just have to agree to disagree. It's all right to disagree, but don't allow separation. Don't allow your emotions to drive you to part from somebody. Some people haven't spoken to folks in years because we allow division to get in there. Man, break that thing off as quick as you can. Go to that person and say, hey, I know we, we've got a little disagreement here, but let's talk through this thing or pray through it or cry through it and love through it or whatever through it, but, but shut it down. I was with, with some brothers the other day, and here was the end result. Three of us talking in the room and said, we're going to come to agree that we disagree. What a beautiful statement. We're not always going to agree with everybody. So we can agree to disagree, but we can still love each other. We can still hold on to each other. That's called unity. Don't let division come in. Okay, I'm, I'm preaching now and I apologize. Let's move on. It's going on 10 o'clock. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to go to um, verse 17. Now in this that I declare to you, I praise you not, that you come together not for better, but for worse. Where there's division and the church still unites, he says you come together for worse, not for better. Some of you may not understand this and some of you will, but if you're from the pulpit end of this church, of any church, and you're out there trying to have a worship service and you sense in your spirit because division is powerful. Hey, Maureen, division is powerful and it can sit in a church and a judgmental attitude from one side can go to the left and people can be in there and they're not focused on worship because they're focused on division and that hinders the entire church service. Some of us may be a little more sensitive to the spirit of God than others. Me, I'm not bragging. I've been raised to listen to the spirit of God in the order of service. 
I'll tell you, if there's division, it's a whole lot better for there to be a pamphlet and says, do this, do this, do this, do this. I mean, if someone just gave me a, a, a direction, the bulletin Sunday morning and said, sing these three songs, preach this message, take this offering. When there's division, that really works. <laughs> because... You can just ignore the people and just do what the bulletin says. But when you're trying to hear the Spirit of God, listen, the church family is the body of Christ as well as the leadership. We're all the body of Christ together. So when we're in that place to hear uh, the Spirit of God, then you start picking up on spiritual blocks in the church a few times over the years i've said intercessors pray you want to know why because division is blocking the way i mean here's how it works just maybe you're in there and you're angry at sally sue across the way and you're frustrated but you come to church anyway because that's your church and maybe you're just stubborn you're not going to miss it Hey, Jessica, you're not going to miss the church service, so you, you're sitting across the way and you're angry at that person. But God may want to use you in a small and insignificant way that will touch somebody's life, but you're not doing it because you're angry and you can't hear him. Understand, Paul was telling this church, you cannot hear God. I want to go back to what we read in the beginning. A young man in their church was having an affair with his stepmother. Paul addressed it. This guy's having an affair with his father's wife. And the church could say, you know you're blind when you can't see something that big. He said, this sin is so big that in the ungodly world, they wouldn't tolerate it but it's being tolerated in the church. He said, there's a problem. Well, where there's envy, division, envy, strife, and division, there's blindness. Hope you're getting it. So he's saying, so when you come together, this isn't for good. It's making things worse. Get your lives in order. This whole book is about unity, guys. I never saw this till we started doing the study. So blame yourselves. <laughs> I'm just playing with you. I love you. For there must be also heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. For when you come together, therefore in one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now he's going to address communion. Now for you and I, we do communion with a cup of uh, juice and a bread or a cracker well their communion literally they called them love feasts they would bring in people and they'd all eat together we call them fellowship dinners and in their fellowship dinner they would take the juice and and the bread and they'd have communion in, in memory of christ it sounds like a beautiful thing unless there's division are you hearing me yeah <laughs> God help us. God help us. You might want to just type in, Lord, stop division. <laughs> help us stop division because it's, and, and I don't see much division right now. Thank you, Jesus. But the enemy's always waiting to cause something. And this early church was in trouble. Even their communion was tainted with sin. So let's go on. Um, Let's read verse 20 to 22. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone takes before the other his own supper. And one is hungry, and another is drunk. What? Have you not houses to eat and drink in? Or despise you the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I won't. And he's saying, you're coming together and there are people that are starving and, and, and you're eating your meal and you don't care about them. And this is in the church fellowship where they have a communion. I mean, the, the lowness of the division that they came into was staggering to me. I mean, that's why Jesus said in, in the book of Revelation, you know, you've left your first love. 
We're to love one another. Someone said to me some time ago, they said, you better store some food up just in case the end time is here and what's going on. I'm thinking, how much food do you store up? Well, guess what? I could go out and spend $1,000 tomorrow and store food up and put it in my pantry, put it in my, my uh, uh, house and seal the door up. And I could just feed me and my family. But I'm going to tell you something. If I caught wind that you didn't have food and I did, I'm going to my pantry. Do you understand? Instead of hoarding it, Love says, go give it away. I told my wife, I said, I'd go give it all away and then we just all starve to death or trust God. That's what the body of Christ is about. But they lost that picture. They'd come in for communion and they'd sit in their groups and they'd have a, a load of food. Hey, uh, Sister Ann, they'd have a load of food to eat and they'd be taking the juice and the communion and they're all holy and these people at this other table have no food to eat and they're looking down on them. We're one family, one church, one body. If one part of my body suffers, Sarah and Caleb came out to the uh, uh, sunrise service, which was beautiful. And they came to the church about five in the morning to pick up some equipment. And she dropped a stand on her toe and cut the top of her toe. And she came to the the, the uh, property over there and helped us set up, but she was hobbling around. When's the last time you dropped something on your toe? Did it hurt your whole body? Your toe hurt, but your whole body felt it. Are you hearing me? Your toe hurt, but your whole body felt it from head to toe. She was every once in a while going, ooh, ah, groaning, moaning, because her toe hurt. Do you understand? God said that's how the body of Christ is. We're to be for each other, guys. If one of us is suffering, we can't fix every problem, but we can cry, we can hurt, we can pray with you. Oh, I wish we were all millionaires. We'd take care of all the everybody's financial issues, but, but we're not. But we all need each other. Your words on here, and you know, people say, well, Pastor Dave, thank you for doing a good Bible study. I'm saying thank you for listening because I get as much out of you as you might get out of me. I mean, prayer meetings Monday night, you think, man, Pastor Dave leading us in prayer meeting. No, <laughs> Pastor Dave is getting led by prayer meeting by just what you guys write on this thing because it's about all of us. It's, there's no big head and little people underneath. It's We are the body of Christ and we all have different purposes and callings and we rejoice when one steps into their calling, whatever it may be. No one's better than the other guys. We all need each other. I seriously said this, when people walk in the church, and maybe we didn't see you for a couple of weeks, you had some things going on, our heart literally pounds stronger, an excitement down deep inside, just because we love you. That's how it works. And that's just not exclusively for me, it's for the entire church world. That's when we function without uh, envy, when we function without strife, then we can be unified and we can enjoy the company of each other. So let's read what Paul wrote. So in uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, this is a well-known scripture for the church world um, that we use when we take communion over and over and over and over so I want to um, read verse 23 because every pastor or leader taking communion reads this. But let's read it in the context of where it is. Verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night which he was betrayed, took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. How many have heard this read? Hundreds of times. And after the same manner, he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This cup 
is the New Testament in my blood. This do as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. And I'm going to say this real quick. This communion that the Lord gave us, when he said this is the blood in the new covenant, the new testament, it's the same legal term of will in testament. And when he died, it activated the promise for you and I that we are covenant children with him. Isn't it beautiful that I can talk to Jesus, that I can say to him, hey, Lord, this is a bad day. Hey, Lord, this is a good day. Hey, Lord. I like to quote David a lot. Do you know David in the book of Psalms wrote a lot of things, and he would start out like this, where are you, God? We have even several, several chapters of Psalms. God, this is a miserable day. I feel like everything's falling apart. Nobody's around. Nobody wants to help me. This is a terrible day. Everyone's against me. Anyone ever had that? And then he starts writing, but I will praise you, but I will magnify your name, but I will worship you, but I will exalt your name on high. I love doing that. I love to walk in the sanctuary and say, my God, this is a horrible week. Be for real. But then switch it around and say, but I will praise your name because you are worthy to be praised. Oh, flip it over on the enemy. You don't have to pretend like you're not upset when you're upset. Stop pretending. Be real. Admit it. God, I am upset, but I'm going to praise you till the upset stops. Hmm. David learned that. That became his great power. Okay. So he's talking about communion. Verse 27, 28. Wherefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body of and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. So let him eat of that bread and drink of the cup. For he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many even sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, and we should not be condemned with the world. Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying, when, listen to me close, church. This is so powerful. When the church harbors when the church harbors envy, strife, division, when the church harbors bitterness, it literally is bringing death to them. That's what it's doing. And he's saying many of you have become sick and have even died because you took the Holy Communion but you brought into it that spirit of pride and division and separation. That should scare all of us. I think he's not just referring to communion. What if we just get up today and say, oh, I'm going to have communion with you, Lord. I want to worship you. And you read your Bible and you say, oh, I praise your name. And you walk away saying, I did my part but you harbored in your heart anger, bitterness, jealousy, envy. Didn't he say in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our sins as we forgive the sins of others. Did you hear me? Forgive us our sins. This is heavy duty today, guys. But this is the key to your success as a Christian. This is the key to our success for blessings. I make it a habit weekly, if not daily, to search my heart. Please don't think I'm bragging. 
This scares me so bad. This scripture scares me more than anything that I, I think I read in the Bible. Not about taking communion. I know after that, he won't even serve communion. This scares him so bad because he puts it all with communion. I'm not saying it's just about the, the holy sacraments. I'm saying that Paul was saying to them, look, you're not discerning God's body when you come to have intimacy with him and you come to claim the covenant promise, but you're not willing to let go of some junk that's called bitterness and envy and jealousy and strife and division and separation. And, and it's, it's not going to work. And, and I'm not standing here as judge and jury because we've all been there. Come on. I don't think anybody, with 23 people listening, I don't think any of us can say, I've never been that way before. We've all been there. Thank God for forgiveness. <laughs> I'm not exalting me. I'm just saying, dear God, I'm scared of this. So what I do daily and weekly is say, God, our Father art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth and it is in heaven. Forgive us our debts as we, forgive us our debts as we, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Do you understand the, the gravity of that? We can't go have fellowship with him. We can't go have communion with him if we're carrying envy and strife and jealousy behind us. If that stuff is there, if, if it is a part of us, we can't go enjoy the Lord because it separates us. And sometimes, unfortunately, we can fall into a hole where we accept that as a life. Some people have been bitter at a parent for 40 years. Bitter at a child, bitter at a friend, bitter at an ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend, bitter at an uncle or a brother or sister or whomever. Oh, dear God, it is called separating us and it hinders our walk with the Lord. Many people in the marriage world say, we read the scripture says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. One of the couples in church been married 60 years, they said, we live by that. We'll never let the sun go down on our anger. That's a powerful statement. How about apply that to you? How about I apply that to me and to the church and say, God, I won't be angry at any. Let's even go deeper than that. Is there a minister on TV that you're angry at because you don't like the way he does what he does? I was speaking with someone the other day and I'm not... I don't even remember who it was, but it's just the truth. There, there are some things I see on TV. Uh, there's some government officials right now that I see that I'm so angry at I could want to spit nails. Anybody with me? I mean, some of us Christians have even said with some of government officials that are just irritating you. Come on, we're all guilty. But yet God said I put them in position. So it's our job to pray for them. You know, Paul said, I gave you milk of the word because you weren't able to handle meat. You're getting meat of the word today. God said, we forgive and he'll forgive us as we forgive. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in me as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Whew. That's what he's talking about. He said, you guys are coming together with these great love feasts and you're having the Lord's Supper, but because you're allowing sin to stay there, it's making some of you sick and killing you. Wow. Think about that. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Lord. I want to be the church I'm called to be. I hope you're with me. We want to be the church that we're called to be. God, help us, Lord, to, to lay down all offenses and all angers and, 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 and lay purely before the Lord and say, here I am, God. My hands are clean because I've forgiven everybody. Oh, God, help us to forgive. Help us to forgive. Don't hold anything if your life is a hotel, don't keep 
room 135 back in the left corner under your rib locked up and that's where that bitterness is. Open that door and say, get out. Can we do that for a minute, God, right now? There's 26 of us online, Lord. We, we say, search our heart, God. Search me. I give you permission, God. Search me. And if there's any level, Father, of jealousy, uh, if there's any level of strife, any level of separation, any level, any level of bitterness in my soul, God. Lord, I don't want to be guilty of your body and your blood. I don't want to take your communion. I don't want to have fellowship with you, Lord, and bring that garbage in. So God, I release that person. I release that thing. I release that situation. I release that memory. I release that pain, God. We give it to you, Lord. We give it to you, God. Oh, Jesus. I'm going to move on quickly here in just a moment, but keep this in mind. Jesus is on the cross. One of the last words he says is, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Listen to me close. No one down there said to him, oh man, we're so sorry. His forgiveness was all one side. Do you understand what I'm saying? It was all from him to them. They didn't reciprocate it. They didn't bring it back to him. It was all about him not allowing it to attach to him. Why did he say it? I never thought about that, but why did Jesus say that at that point? At that single point, why did Jesus say he's hanging on the cross, he's dying, he's been through all this, they beat him, they've abused him. Why did he say, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do? Maybe to fulfill scriptures, but I think it goes a little more simpler than that. Maybe at that moment, the enemy was saying, see, they don't care. Maybe the enemy was saying, see, the people that you created hate you. See, they're mocking you. And on the cross, maybe the enemy was trying to get him to get into pride and anger. It's all tied together. And instead of doing that, he said, Father, forgive them. Think about it. They're throwing stones at Stephen. I preached this some time ago. They're throwing stones at Stephen. I don't know the last time you got hit by a rock, but their rocks were much bigger than ours. While, listen, while they are murdering him, he says, Father, hold not this sin to their charge. I see Jesus standing at the right end of power and he dies and goes home with the Lord. Even in the midst of being murdered, his connection to God was such love for people that he forgave them. I don't want anything to separate me from God's presence. I hope you're hearing me. Okay. Whew. I didn't realize how much was in here. This is pretty neat stuff. I'm going to try to finish chapter 11. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we're chastened by the Lord. And we should not be condemned with the world. Let me read it again. For if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. You know what he's saying is, let's judge us first. Search my heart, O oh God. Let there not be one single wicked way in my heart. We get so focused, listen to me, church. We get so focused on the sins that we see people do. Oh my, do you see what they did? Oh my, they, they've got problems. Oh my, they need help. I'm going to tell you something. The hidden sin of the heart, to me, is a whole lot worse than the action sin of the hand. I'm not justifying either one. But the hidden sin of the heart, this is what the apostle is saying. That's a whole lot worse than the action sin of the hand. Just think about that. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. For if any man be hungry, let him eat at home, that you come not together unto condemnation. And the rest I will set in order when I come to you. Again, Paul is having to say, I'm going to set everything in complete order and try to fix you guys and get your head screwed on straight. Whew. Oh my, 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 my. Okay, 
It is going on 1030. I normally go to 11. We're on chapter 12. I need you to tell me, because I'm going to wrap it up right here and start with chapter 12 next week, unless you want me to go on for a few more minutes. So just kind of let me know, because I, I, I know we've been online almost an hour now, and I don't want to lose people because it's too long. So I'm going to look for some response. I know there's a delay. So just tell me, keep going or see you next week. One of the two. And I'm going to look at your, your uh, viewpoints and we'll make a decision here. So uh, we're getting ready to start chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. And um, we'll start talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit here in just a few minutes or next week. So come on, throw me some things. I see some amens. Okay. I, get, I have one saying, keep going. Who else? Do you want to go? or want to? Okay, Amy says, keep going. Joyce says, keep going. Okay, anybody else on there want me to keep going? We've got 26 people. Uh, Billy Beeks, thank you for the word. See you tomorrow. God bless. Okay, Billy. Uh, uh, Pam says, keep going. Amen. Because some people have stuff they have to do, and I understand. Amanda Lee, yes, okay. Um, so I suppose we'll keep going for a few more minutes and those that, that have to leave, um, we only got about 25, 30 minutes left. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, so you can come back and you can just watch the rest of this. Cause I think it's all very important because I know uh, everyone can't just take their day and say, I'm stopping everything for an hour and a half. It doesn't work like that. But, uh, so those of you that have to go, we love you. Thank you for tuning in and just go back a little bit later and, and uh, you can just play, start halfway through or something. We're one hour into the starting, so whatever is left on that. And uh, okay, Jason, I got enough of you that said go, so we're going to um, keep going. Chapter 12 of the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant you know that you were, in the past, Gentiles carried away with dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man, speaking by the Spirit of God, calls Jesus accursed, and that no man can say Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Spirit. Um, I'm just going to read a note down here. It was a practice among the Jews to call Jesus Aranathia accursed, one so abominable as not fit to live on earth. It was an early practice among heathen persecutors to force believers to call Jesus accursed. No man speaking by the Holy Spirit will ever do so, and no man can call Jesus Lord but by the Spirit. And I want to say this. If it came down to a, all of you on here, I know most of you, I can't speak for everybody, but let's just say it came down to a life or death situation where they said, you have to deny Jesus Christ or we're going to kill you. That's an insane question for the true Christian. You see, the early church didn't have a choice because he was so in their heart. If they denied him, that would be a lie. They couldn't do it. And it comes down to this. If, if, if I was in a position where it's a life or death situation and they say, you need to deny the Lord, I'm going to say it's impossible. Even if I said I deny him, it's all going to be a lie because he's in my heart and he's in my life. I love him. And that's what Paul is saying. He's saying, when you know him, you know him. If you know him, you can't say he's accursed. If you know him, you can't deny him. And if you don't know him, you can. Sorry, some of you are stuck. <laughs> You're stuck in love with Jesus. And he's proved himself so real to you that you can never say, I can't believe he's real. Think about the testimonies you have and the things God has done for you. Think about the times where you know he did it and nobody else did. Those are so burned and branded inside our spirits 
that no matter what this world offers, we can't say it's not real because we know the King of glory. His name is Jesus. So Paul is getting into the place of spiritual gifts. And so starting with verse 4, he says, Now there are diversities of gifts, but it's the same Spirit. And there are diversities of administration, but it's the same Lord. And there are diversities of operation, but it's the same God, which works all in all. And it, it's amazing to me, 4, 5, and 6 speaks about the Spirit, the Lord, and God. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's what he does. There are diversities of gifts. There's a whole variety of gifts, but it's the same Holy Spirit that has them all. And there are different differences of administration, but it's the same Lord that runs it. And there are diversities of operation, but it's the same God that works all in all. God is in charge of all this. God is in charge of all this. And here's the coolest thing. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are there to function through us. If you think about this, God said, I'm going to fill you with my... First, I'm going to forgive your sins. I'm going to give you my love and my peace. Then I'm going to give you my spirit to live inside of you. And not only will the spirit be in you, but he'll be upon you. Then I'm going to have my angels to be around you. The angels camp around about those that fear God. Okay? Then I'm going to put my armor on you so that you can stand firm. The shield that you carry is going to be filled with my faith. And the sword of the Spirit is me, the Word of God. So we have the living Word Jesus and the written Word Jesus. So we have the shield of faith. We have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Those are all His gifts. And then He says, now, the Spirit that's inside of you, the Holy Spirit, he will begin to function out of you with giftings that will touch the entire world. Are you hearing me? How cool is that? Where the Holy Spirit uses you in certain gifts at certain times. Someone says, well, does anybody have all the, the gifts of the Spirit? I think that's a crazy question. Borderline's ridiculous. Because if I have one Holy Ghost, he possesses all the gifts. So he's the one that functions them all through us at his will. Now there are certain ones that have dominating gifts. I'm not going to go into all of that. I know there are dominating gifts, but it's the same Holy Spirit. What a God. It says, not only will I forgive your sins, not only will I fill you with my spirit, I'll put my spirit on you, I'll let my angels surround you and protect you, I'll give you my armor, it's my armor that will protect you, my helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and that you'll stop the fiery darts of the enemy with the shield of faith, and then I'll empower you with giftings as needed to touch this world. Wow. Wow. How about this one? We'll read it later. He says, I'm going to build the whole church on five major gifts. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. That's where it starts. And then flowing out of that is every other gift. What a God. What an organization. What a military operation that God says, this is how it's going to work. I'm going to empower every one of you. And then I'm going to put... Forgive the word, generals over the, over the kingdom to guide it, to build my church. And then I'm going to infuse in you my power that you are a weapon that can't be stopped. <laughs> wow. I mean, think about it. Peter came out as a weapon, opened his mouth for the first time after he was repentant, after he laid, laid down pride and after he got filled with the Holy Spirit. And his first message he preached, 3,000 people said, what do we do to get saved? Hmm. If that's not a weapon, I don't know what is. They saw so much power in his life. They said, we'll bring the sick out just so his shadow will cross them and many would be healed. Do you understand who you are? You are a powerhouse in the kingdom of God. You are somebody. Whew. 
Inside of you is the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, just waiting to explode out of your life. You got to get up in the morning and say, here's my hands, Lord. Here's my feet. I forgive everybody. Lord, give me a clean heart and a pure mind, Father. Here I am. What do you want to do? Do you want to use me in the gift of healing today? Do you want to use me, Father, to speak a word of encouragement in somebody's life? Do you want to use me to stir somebody's heart in conviction? Do you want to use me in hospitality or serving? Oh my, there's a load. Let's read. Okay, so, but the manifestation, the word manifestation means the revealing of the Spirit is given to every man to profit all of them. Did you hear me? I don't have an exclusive gift for David Meeks. Any gifts that he puts in me are to profit the whole body. Are you hearing? Because we're all apart. One might be the toe, one might be the foot, one might be the leg. Are you understanding? The ear can't say to the mouth, I don't need you. The mouth can't say to the eyes, I don't need you. We need each other. And we need the gift inside of you to be manifesting, to be working. But listen, the gift can't work properly if I have envy, strife, and division. Oh my, help us, Lord. Okay. For to one is given the spirit of the word of wisdom. To another, the word of knowledge by the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, the gift of healing by the same spirit. To another, working of miracles by the same spirit. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. And to another, interpretation of tongues. You know what that really means? It's, uh, let's just reverse them. But all these work that one and the self same spirit dividing to every man severally as he wills. Do you understand that God is saying, I will use you with my Holy Spirit. I'm going to read it again in a minute. For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many, are only one body, so also is Christ. You know, I saw a picture of Jesus drawn one time. I thought it was the most awesome picture. Had him from head to toe standing there. I think he had a white uh, like uh, garment on. And when you look close, it was all people. The whole picture was little people drawn all over the place. His beard was people. His eyes were people. His ears were people. His clothes were people. Because that's who we are. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles. Whether we bond or free. And have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member but many. If the foot shall say because I'm not the hand I am not of the body. Is it not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body was an eye, how would it hear? And if the whole was an ear, how would it smell? But now has God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it pleased him. You don't need to change to conform to what your pastor or a leader says. You need to pursue God. And I'm not, please don't mix that up. I'm saying don't be a people pleaser. You're gifting. It may take leaders to help you develop that gift. But your gift is your gift. Be you. Oh, just be you. God chose you. Let him use you. It's very powerful. If they all were one member, where's the body? But now are they many members, yet one body. 
The eye cannot say, verse 21, to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much more, those members of the body, listen, which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon them that we bestow the most honor, our uncomely, uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For the comely parts have no need, but God has tempered the body together, having given much abundant honor to the part that lacks. God knew his business. My hands are always out. Sometimes you look at my hands and they're callous, they're bruised, they're cut, they're broken. They're out in the front. But it doesn't mean they're the most important parts. Because my liver, <laughs> um, my kidneys, my heart and my lungs, these things are all covered up. But oh, how important they are. See, we judge people by what this looks like and the hands do and all this stuff. And God is saying, look at the body the way I designed it. The parts that don't seem important, the ones that aren't out in the front that everybody's seeing, those are the things that keep you functioning. Put that in the church, the parts that nobody sees. Let me make this real clear. I could not preach this gospel. I could not hold these daily uh, words from the Lord. I could not keep doing this over and over and over and over, except you, the body of Christ, is praying and holding my arms up. You guys are praying, Lord, give him the right word. You guys are praying, God, strengthen him. You guys are praying, Lord, give him good health. You guys are praying those things. That's what keeps this flowing. So even though I might be the one out in the front that everybody gets to see, it's all the parts that they don't see that keep us going. Are you hearing? That's how we do this. It's that hidden intercessor at home in the middle of the night that is bringing your name up before God. That's the comely part that's most important. No one gets to see it, but God says, I do. <laughs> okay. For our comely parts have no need, but God has tempered the body together, having given more honor to the part that lacks, that there be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. For whether one member suffer, all members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all members rejoice with it. You know, I've seen people that had liver issues and their skin started turning a little yellow, I think. I've seen people with kidney issues and their body started to swell. Many of the diseases internally affect us externally. And he's saying, and that would be called division in the body. And he's saying, but when the body is unified, every part functioning the way it's supposed to, the body is healthy. Are you hearing me? When the church family is in unity, when the church family is connected, we won't allow the division and every part does their part, keeping jealousy and division out, staying in unity. The body can function strong. My grandson got up this morning, Caden, don't understand, he's 17 years old. I guess when you're 17, your head is different than, I mean, I remember when I was 17 and things go a little differently. He gets up this morning. He decided he's going to be in shape. So he gets up this morning and he runs where I live in my subdivision. He walks and runs it. Sprints some, walks some, runs it. 10 miles. <laughs> 10 miles. So I'm in the house getting ready for pastor's prayer and the door opens, the dog barks. And I said, what's going on? And he comes in and he's 
not winded at all. And he sits down and says, what you been doing? He says, oh, I ran around Hideaway. I'm thinking around the block. He said, no, the whole thing. You ran around the whole thing. He said, yeah. He says, I got a little winded here and there, but he said, I'd sprint, I'd stop, I'd set a goal, I'd run, I'd walk. So I averaged it out. I said, well, you were going about six miles an hour the whole time. And that's what happens, listen to me, when your whole body is functioning together. When all the parts internally work, you can do that. Well, I'm going to say this, taking it to the spiritual standpoint, when you do your part with God, when you forgive others, hey, Darren Jr., good to have you. If you're just signing in, go back and listen to this from the beginning when we're done. We're almost wrapped up. It's pretty strong. Been praying for you, man. <clears throat> when we recognize that the Spirit of God is in us and He has a purpose for our life, and we get rid of division, jealousy, envy, and strife, and we submit to God, we forgive others, He can start using us in our purpose in the kingdom. Okay. I got four verses and we're done. <clears throat> no, now, now, everyone say now. You are the body of Christ and members in particular. And God has set some in the church. First apostles, secondarily prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings, then gifts of helps, then governments and diversities of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all miracle workers, have all the gift of healings, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts, yet I will show you a more excellent way. I want to go back real quick and say this. Someone reads this and says, see, everybody doesn't speak in tongues. This is not referring to the gift of the Holy Ghost. He said the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for all my church. It's for you. It's for you and it's for me. But the gift of speaking in tongues is different than the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The gift of speaking in tongues is where you speak out loud into a crowded area and then an interpretation comes and you're saying, this is what God is saying. And when you do that, it will convict the hearts of men. So let me read this again because we're about to wrap this up. Know, ye, know that you are the body of Christ and members in particular, and God has set some in the church. This doesn't mean first. It's just giving an order, but it doesn't mean better than the other. Apostles. Thank God for apostles, the sent ones. That's who they were. That's who they are. There's prophets and teachers. And then uh, gifts of miracles. Listen, gifts of helps. Did you understand that helps is a gift of the Spirit? Many of you in this church love to help people. That's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The gifts of governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers? Of, and the answer is no. Does everyone have the gift of healing? No. Do you all speak with tongues? Do you all interpret? No. And don't be jealous of a one that does. Be in unity. He says, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I'll show you a more excellent way, and that more excellent way is the way of love. What good is a gift of the Spirit? What good is preaching? What good is prophesying? What good is the gift of healing or miracles? What good is the gift of helps or governments? What good is an apostle or a prophet? or an evangelist, or a pastor, or a teacher, if we don't have love. That's the bottom line. Do you know what love, I'm going to tell you what true love is. Love is never looking to receive and is always willing to give. See, someone might say, see, you're not a Christian because you don't love me. No, it's you, not them. Ouch, I know. Well, they're not showing me love. No, it's you, not them, because love is never looking to receive love. Love is always giving. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son.
For God so loved you and I, he gave. He came and he gave not expecting anything. That's God. Tony, I love you. I'm about to wrap this up. I want you to understand God gave his son to love this world. Not expecting anything in return. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Lord. Oh, what a God. Hmm. My Jesus. Father, we honor you. Father, we praise you. Father, we love you. Bless each one, Lord, that's joined me today. Thank you for this family. I pray, God, that your word will penetrate hearts and souls of each one. Amen. Remember this. Uh, I'm just trying to throw this out just to get it in the memory. If you have offerings for the Lord, give the fi. You can give it that way or bring it by the church or mail it to the church. Um, tomorrow morning, tonight at 7, the youth will be live having worship and praise in a very powerful time. Um, uh, we're still limited to 10 people. Uh, so most of that's the worship team. And then tomorrow at noon, I'll be speaking again, uh, at noon and we'll be sharing, uh, a word of encouragement from the Lord. We've been doing this every week, every day. Please pray for me that I will keep hearing his voice. I love each one of you. Hold each other up. I'm going to let you guys talk to each other for a minute. I'm going to step away from the camera. I love you. Thank you for being a part of this. I'm going to give you about two minutes to communicate. Billy, thank you for joining with us and Amy and Joy and uh, uh, Darren Jr. and all of you guys. So many, so many names. I hope you've enjoyed it. God bless you. I'm going to step away from the camera. You can talk to each other. And when you're ready to go, go. And I'm going to... About 60 seconds or so, turn this thing off. Love you guys. Just talk for a while. Have some fellowship.